Great to speak with you. How are you today? Yeah, man, I'm good, I'm good. Well, uh, again, thanks for talking to me. I'll try not to take up too much of your time. I'm aware that you have uh, several interviews today. Um, <laughs> now, my, my my earliest memory of music was of my dad blasting your Big Love album out of speakers that were bigger than me. That That's where my love of reggae comes from. Where does your passion for the genre come from, and when did you first realise that you wanted music to be your life? Well, I grew up in Borsal Heath, which is in South Birmingham. Um, which is a predominantly immigrant area. So I grew up listening to Indian music and reggae music. They were the musics of the streets where I grew up. Um, I actually came from a folk background because my dad had a folk group. Um, so we were always surrounded by folk musicians. Um, yeah, people like the Dubliners and the Chieftains and even Billy Connolly, I remember, in the Humble Bums and all that. All used to stay at our house. But the folk music thing didn't grab me at all, you know. And I grew up with reggae like, like my West Indian friends did, you know what I mean? Yes. Um, and that's why I play reggae. I love it. I lived and I grew around it, you know, from the age of 10 years old. You know, I was also into Stevie Wonder and the Jackson 5, Marvin Gaye and the Tamil Motown thing. But, you know, it's just the music that moved my muscle is, is, uh, is reggae, you know. You said many times that Sly and Robbie are your inspiration. What is it about them that you find so inspiring? Oh, the fact that they're the greatest drum and bass combo in the world. <laughs> I think yeah. that inspires me quite a lot. <laughs> and uh, it's not just me. If you look at all the contemporary uh, dance music that we've got going on at the moment, it's all influenced by Sly and Robbie, by Sly Dunbar's beats. Yes. As, you, as, as, as music homogenises all around the world, you know, like everything else, um, it's becoming it's like one sort of dance beat and it's a Sly Dunbar beat you know so yeah. Sly Dunbar and reggae are, are more influential now than they've ever been you know reggae itself and Sly Dunbar um, and Robbie they are um, influencing music all over the world at this moment in time there are so many variations of reggae now and uh, do, do you have a preference or can I assume that you just like it all oh yeah well obviously I love all kinds of yeah. Um, you know, uh, you, you see, reggae goes in sort of little periods, doesn't it? You, yeah. know, you had your roots rock reggae, you had your ska, then you had rock steady, then you had roots rock reggae, and then since then we've had dancehall and ragga and bashment and reggaeton. They're all different styles of reggae, but the same thing. And like I said, all of the contemporary dance music we're listening to is all the same beats, that's the same uh, ragga beats, you yeah. know, and the same dub productions, you know. I saw you before 40 live at Wembley just before you left in 2008 and um, having grew up around the sound of UB40 I was, uh, I was pretty gutted when you left but I was equally elated when you continued your solo career. What can you, t what, what can you tell me about your, your feelings during that transformation? Were you relieved to break away? Was it something that you always wanted to do? No, not at all. I didn't intend to break away. Um, what happened was, I mean, I made my first solo album in 1994, as you know. Um, Big Love. Yeah, Big Love, yeah. Uh, and I had no intentions of leaving then. And I had no intentions of leaving this time round. I was actually forced into leaving my band, the band that I started, you know. Um, yes. I was forced into leaving it by, because of the management, you know. I was having horrible problems with the management who weren't giving me stuff that I was entitled to. And really became like a standing joke. I was moaning. Right. I was because I didn't know where the money was going. I didn't know who was making decisions, you know. And so I was very unhappy. And when um, I asked for time off um, to, to promote my album, Running Free, which had gone in at number nine in the chart. Always running free. Always running free. Always running free, always running free. Um, I went to the band, I gave, I gave them six months advance notice, you know, and the management just said, right, then, what I want to do is promote my album for a month, you know, uh, in six months' time, in June or whatever it was. And they said no. So, coupled with all the other problems I was having with the management, so I went, so I did then, you know, I'm out of here, because I'd been, I'd been four years, I'd been battling with the management, you know, and um, because it was my band and I was loath to leave it, you know, um, it was it was them telling me I couldn't go and promote my solo album that broke the, that was the straw that broke the camel's back sort of thing. 
Yes, yes, I understand. And then I left, you know, but it was very acrimonious and it's very unpleasant. It still is, actually. Um, yeah. I went about my business promoting reggae. This is what I started uh, UB44. And um, for five years I've been flying the flag for reggae with the death band, you know, going around the world. Uh, playing, playing all over the world, basically, all over South America and Africa and Australasia. We've got out to the Solomon Islands, even. But um, then when the old GB40 released the country album, yeah. The yeah. Film, well, that was like a slap in the face to me because it was my band that I'd left and my brand that I'd left, you know. Yes. Um, and it, not only was it a slap in the face to me, but it was a slap in the face to all our fans, you know, to the people who yes. made GB40 who they were, which was the biggest selling reggae band in the world. And um, so, uh, so when GB40, the old boys, did that, Oh, an Astro left them because obviously there's no room for a, a Rasta man in a country. <laughs> uh, what was it, Django Unchained? Astro came over to me and Mickey was with me already. So we had three original members of the band, the two the original vocalists and me and Mickey, the, the original rhythm section. So um, we decided to, to take the name back and that's what we're doing. We're going out as UB40. Yes, brilliant. And that's what we're doing there. You know, we've got um, about 50 around the world at the moment, penciled in, and we're going down, we're going out as UB40, so we're reclaiming, you know, um, the legacy, you know, that was nearly shot to bits by the old ones. So let me go, just let me fly away, let me feel the space between us, grow deeper and darker every day, watch me now. Out From Under is one of my favourite songs from you as a solo artist. To what extent is that a song about you leaving a group that you dedicated 28 years of your life to? <laughs> well, I thought it was a pretty apt um, lyric at the time, you know? Yes. Uh, but it, I actually got that. I was at the school run with my daughter and she was listening to Circus by Britney Spears. And <laughs> that song is on that album, Britney Spears album. Um, I've forgotten my shame, I've forgotten the man who wrote it now, but he's a, he's a big songwriter, he's written a lot of great songs. And I heard Britney Spears singing it, and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I said to my management, I'm going to cover a Britney Spears track, and I thought I'd lost my mind. And, uh, but then I did, and I wonder, um, yeah, I like that track as well, it's quite hard to sing. Yeah, but... but you, have to, you have to cover two, two octaves, you know. Yeah. I remember watching an interview um, with you when you were promoting your Great British Songs album, um, oh, yeah. and you said in the interview that you just take a song and and you regify it. Can you take me through the process you go through when you regify these these covers? Like, where do you start? Do you work at it, or does a tune just come to you? Well, the reason that I did the um, Great British Songs really is because um, just before I did that, I did. Um, a cover of Prince's Purple Rain with Fun Loving Criminals. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to be released um, probably in the next couple of months. It's a few years ago we did it, but it's, uh, Frank's just got his deal together and everything. Um, and that was a very unlikely co uh, reggae cover. So uh, it was very successful and we, we, we thought it really worked. So that got me to thinking, you know, well, what else could I cover in reggae? You know, and uh, I started coming up with songs that were the least likely to be covered, you know, like All Right There by Free. Yeah, you know? that's one of my favourites, actually. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, but they were just songs, um, not necessarily favourites, really, but they were iconic, you know, rock songs that were the last song you'd, you'd ever think would be, you know, put into a reggae format. Yeah. And um, it was a lot of fun, actually. Me, Sly and Robbie did that in six, six days at, yeah. Jamaica, at the uh, Anchor Studios. And Sly and Robbie still laugh at the fact that we did uh, Baker Street and, and, <laughs> and, and you know, Honky Tonk Woman and all that. That yeah. was hilarious. And, yeah. uh, but I thought it was quite, quite a good album. It was a bit of a project album, really. It, sort of, it was an idea that turned into an album, basically. And uh, I was still trying to work on, uh, on this new album that we've done now. But, you know, we just got carried away with the concept and uh, went up to Jamaica, did it with your best mates. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I like that album.
beats of um, Love is the Drug and Paint, um, Paint It Black, they're some of the best beats I've, I've ever heard. Come on. <laughs> when, yeah, when, when, you're, when you're coining these beats, um, you know, does it just come to you or do you, have, do you work at it? How do you find these tunes? Is there any songs that you've tried and then just haven't worked, or can you regify any song? Uh, no, there's a few that I've tried, uh, but I'll try again, actually. Um, uh, what was the song? Cut Me Rebel. Right. What was their song? Come Up and See Me. Okay. Make Me Smile, you know that song? Yes, yes. Come Up and See Me, Make Me Smile. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that didn't work yet, but, I mean, but I will do it at some point in the future, <clears> Do you have plans to do a part two? Oh, volume two of Red Bull, you Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to, yeah. And yeah. That would be, be a good laugh. But like I said, it would, it would be, you know, um, a sort of side project. Okay. You know, and, and again, I'd do it with Sly and Robbie because that would be great, you know, uh, to get like three or four volumes of that would be good with <laughs> Sly and Robbie. It would be, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, you, you've sang with some great artists throughout your career, but is there anyone you haven't worked with yet that you would really like to? Yes, yeah, I, yeah, I've heard. It happened on the, on the first album, Rugged Free, when they got uh, Smokey Robinson, sorry, not that one, um, the one after that. No, Smokey Robinson was on Running Free, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, so the, reason, the, the way I got Smokey on that was I told him Stevie Wonder was doing it. <laughs> and Stevie was doing it, but lost the tape. Yeah. Um, because he lives, he lives in his own time zone, Stevie, so, you know, we'd phone him up. Um, oh, what's his, his manager's name? somebody in London we'd always phone him and say Steve you've done that number and he'd go yes he's assured me he's done it and he's just looking for it and he'll send it to you <laughs> and it never does um, so I'd love to get, get something done with Steve you wonder whether he would be playing harp or you know singing on something it'd be fantastic um, I'd, love to, I'd love to work with Paul McCartney who's, uh, he was actually at that gig that you came to at Wembley he wrapped up on his own he's, he's lovely like that and he just came and saw us backstage and he actually had a, a meeting with Denny Lane that he hadn't seen for years uh, in the audience. And he found my house, actually, after the show, <coughs> to tell me how much he enjoyed it. So, yeah, I'd like to work with Paul McCartney, cause, just because he's, he's a Beatle. And although I, I grew up listening to reggae and to, to Tamla Motown and, and everything, you know, like every other English kid uh, growing up in the 60s, um, you know, I was 10 years old in 1960. Um, so obviously I, I lived, you know, I listened to the Beatles. Yeah. Okay. Like anyone. Yeah, you have you, you have a very unique voice, which is one of the reasons why you before it doesn't work without you. And despite your brother's attempts, it is a voice that is irreplaceable. How how have you managed to hone in on such an incredibly distinctive sound? Well, it comes from my lungs apparently. Um, I was told by a doctor once um, that because I sing through my nose, <laughs> not through my throat. <laughs> Okay. Um, and also, because um, I have pleurisy, uh, it kind of puts a strain on your on your voice. You know what I mean? It sounds like you're straining, which I, I guess makes me sound soulful. But it's just trying to squeeze the air out of my lungs. <laughs> what can you tell me about your feelings on reforming with Astra and Mickey? Who initiated it, and will it affect your work as a solo artist? Of course, it will affect my work. What we do, well, what made a new album. Um, six months ago actually but because Astro came back and did the shows with us at the O2 and uh, we just played in Nigeria last week um, starting the 2014 world tour yeah um, so obviously I'm doing I'm going to be doing more, more tracks that include Astro yeah and uh, I mean Mickey, like Mickey said it's like when we were asked what's it like working with Astro again he said it's like putting on a pair of old boots yeah I did read that actually yeah yeah, yeah and I thought that was quite funny and quite, yeah Performed, it was like we hadn't, we hadn't not performed 
Yeah, I bet. I guess it's like riding a bike, in it, for you guys when you've been together for so long? Well, exactly. You know, it was twenty. I was with them for twenty-eight years. In fact, I could have murdered them and done less time. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a point actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you've already you've already expressed disappointment towards the album getting over the storm, and and I join you in that. What can your fans expect from your upcoming album? I understand you're determined to continue flying the flag for reggae. Of course, yeah. Well, that's what it is. It's a hundred percent reggae album. It's you know in the story of my productions, it's the best one I've done. You know, and uh, each album I do, I kind of I think I've learned from the one before, and I get a better balance. You know, it's all about balancing the, the bass drum and the bass guitar for me. Yes. You know what I mean, it's uh, and then once you get that magic balance, and the whole track starts to sink a bass, and uh, that's when you know you're doing it right. Uh, so this new album is just strictly reggae. There's um, seven covers and seven originals. Um, we're thinking of popping on a couple of track, a couple of extra tracks as bonus tracks as well. Um, and I know the fans are going to love it because it sounds very much like the new fresh UB40 album. Come on, come on, let the action begin. We love to party and party again. Go tell your family, go tell your friends. The party don't stop till the music ends. You released um, reggae music to mark the re reforming of the three founding members, which is a great track, by the way. Um, yeah, that was just to, just to show people that you know things are things are up and running. You know. Have you got a title and a release date in mind for your new album? Well, um, it's going to be coming out on Cooking Vinyl, and it will be then that decide when we release it. Like I said, it was it was really completed six months ago, so it shouldn't be too long now. Okay. Um, it was its working title was Rhythm Method. I just thought that was a great <laughs> album title. Um, it might change now because we might have some lead tracks. Uh, we've done a great version of Dennis Brown's uh, old reggae yes. classic silhouette. Well, what we thought was a Dennis Brown reggae classic silhouette. It was actually recorded by Peter Noon and Herman's Hermits uh, in 1969 with Mickey Mouse at Rack Studios, which is where I went to record the album. So I actually brought the that song home without knowing it. Okay. Uh, silhouette. So, I mean, the album might even be called Silhouette, I don't know. As well as this new album, uh, you've already said you've, st you've started touring this year. Will Will you perform any of your UB40 Milestone songs during this tour? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what we do is, uh, I'm not suffering children, we, we play to an audience who's, who's paid to see us, you know, and I know that they want to hear, you know, the red, red wine and kind of falling yeah. in love and, you know, Kingston Town. Yeah. You know, all those all those old classics yeah. and I'm very lucky with UB40 you know I have 40 top 20 hits so I've got a lot of a lot of hits to, to sort of draw on yeah. and that's what we give them really is um, the greatest hits you know the greatest hits gig yeah brilliant with, with all the original singers singing them <laughs> when I saw you in Wembley you were um, it was it was that night that I was introduced to Maxi Priest I hadn't heard of them before um, okay. before that gig what's um, what's your relationship with Max? Do you, do you still have much involvement with them? I saw Max the, um, last week at the Roundhouse. We did the Night of Reggae for Children in Need. Okay. Uh, and uh, I ended up on stage with Jimmy Cliff singing The Harder They Come <laughs> with, uh, with Maxie and with Brimsley Ford from Aswad and with uh, Astro. We had a great time, actually. Really good night. And, uh, yeah, I see Maxie all the time. He's he's another man who, who you know, flies the flag for reggae around the world. Ambassador for reggae. Yes. And, uh, for years. Yes, and uh, he he collaborated again with the the other UB40 on Dance Until the Morning Light. What did you he think did of that one? His yeah, I was going to ask. Well, you know, it was that, it was all a, it was a bit like headless chickens running around, wasn't it? You know, yeah. Have a clue. Uh, and and you know, as Astro said, you know, after Mickey and I left, they were like a rudderless ship. Mm. You know. Brother Duncan, he obviously doesn't have as strong a reggae interest as you, does he? Oh, absolutely not. He doesn't understand reggae 
you saw, that's why it's an abomination that he's doing what he's doing. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you go on my Twitter account, you'll see the rendition of Can't Have Fallen in Love by him and and uh, Robin and the rest of them in a, at a gig in Dubai, and I think that says it all. I, I can't understand, obviously, you, you'd be thought with their, with their reggae legacy. Um, can you shed any light on whether there was any kind of logic in in the other UB40 taking a, a country direction into getting over the storm? For me, there's absolutely no logic in that. You know, it was a <clears throat> jaw-droppingly astonishing moment when I first heard that, what they'd done, you know, I was, I was shocked. And really, it's, it's, it's their little way of having a dig at me, you know, and I think it's ridiculous because they've destroyed their career. Yeah. And, you know, it's the fans that matter, not them. Yes, definitely. Definitely. The fans, the fans of reggae music, you know, and I'm, I'm sure they were appalled, you know, um, when they heard the getting over the storm thing. I don't know if you've heard any of it. I have, yeah. I've heard a, I've heard a lot of it. I, I kept listening to a track hoping the next one would get better, but it never did. <laughs> no, no, it's shocking. And, um, yeah, you know, that, that, I've, I've sat back for five years watching them, watching Duncan, my older brother, destroy the legacy of UB40, you know, and uh, that was, again, the final when when they did that, that country thing, you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, speechless. I can't understand it at all. You know, talk about Roger the ship, that's like... Yes. <laughs> that's a sunk ship, that's a ship that's sunk, yeah. Ali, you're, you're, you're a very humble and down-to-earth guy, and I've, I've seen that so clearly today. Um, have you ever found it difficult to maintain that quiet focus, being as successful as you are? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I've got a great band now as well, which is something I'm really happy with. I'm really lucky that I, I, I lucked out, you know, with the, with the guys that I put in the band. Um, I only shuffled them around a little bit and lost a couple of people, but now we've been a strong sort of band for five years. And uh, yeah, that's what keeps me going. I've got a great band and I'm touring and I'm making albums and I'm doing what I've always done, you know. Yeah. And, uh, Okay, that's great to hear. A question that's often asked of musicians: um, What artists do you like to listen to on a regular basis, and um, do you, do you listen to your own music? Uh, no, no, I don't listen to my own music. No, you you should. It's pretty good. Well, yeah, I know. I was there when I made it. Yeah. And, uh, the thing is that uh, I'm kind of. It's a bit like my my personal music choice. I uh, I like to digest new reggae. And then throw it away. I don't have a record collection for that reason because I'm always searching for the next drum and bass, the next sound, the next vibe, you know. Uh, and it's the same with my music, you know. Yeah, I did that and then I've got a fire list and carry on with something else, you know. I mean, it, it is nice to, you know, occasionally have little parties with the band and we play stuff, you know. Um, but generally, I listen to, at the moment, I'm listening to Popcorn and Mavado uh, and Vibes Cartel, uh, Black Black Rhino, Busy Signal, uh, Laden, all those guys. What? You know, I love all. I love modern reggae. You know, and that's what I follow. What about Collie Buds? Um, um... Yeah, Wicked. Yeah, Bermuda, yeah. I've, I've always thought I'd love to I'd love to be able to listen to a collaboration with Ali Campbell and Collie Buds. That would be... Um... Oh, yeah, that, if you get singing about Hydrate, absolutely. As a very last question, what's your favourite song of all time and what's your favourite lyric? If you are a big tree, I am a small axe, ready to cut you down, which was from Lee Perry's and the way this African Herbsman. Yeah, I know it, yeah. It changes, I suppose. One of my very favourites is um, Are We a Warrior by Niger Man. Okay. That's a fabulous song. Uh, I'm not even sure what the song is about, actually. Uh, <laughs> but it moves me every time. Okay, brilliant. Well, it's been a great honour to speak with you, Ali. I wish you every success with your uh, upcoming material, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in June. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go away now and um, check out your Twitter page. So, um... Oh, great. Now, listen, you will laugh till you're ready. All right, nice one. All right, thank, thank you very much, Ali. Okay, respect you, mate. Take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Only fools ride.
machine.